And so we praise and thank you for that plan that you have put uh, into this world and that you are carrying out and that we are a part of. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that dwells within us, that gives us the power to live for you and to overcome sin in our lives. And God, we come before you in submission today and we just ask your blessing upon this evening. We ask your blessing upon Andrew Sandlin and, and upon Chuck Dowdy and we pray God, that you will give us uh, supernatural and spiritual wisdom, as James wrote about, that's beyond our own wisdom, that we might be able to truly discern your word and that we might be able to understand it and to be able to grasp it and its truths that you have plainly written out as you have communicated to us. And this night, we just pray that you will be honored, that you will be glorified, and that truth will be made known and that truth would be understood. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Our guest, Andrew Sandlin, is editor-in-chief of the Chalcedon Report and the Journal of Christian Reconstruction. He is executive director of Chalcedon Foundation, the founder of the American Reconstructionist Societies, and co-founder of the Association of Free Reformed Churches. An interdisciplinary scholar, he holds academic degrees or concentrations in English, history, and political science. His essays appear in numerous scholarly and popular publications. He has spoken internationally at conferences and in other forums. He is president of the National Reform Association and a member of the Board of International Church Relief Fund, an international missionary agency. He is married and has five children. Charles Dowdy, uh, our Calvinist uh, opponent, uh, is a senior minister, senior evangelist of the Church of Christ here at Mountain View. He is also the president of the Bible College here at Mountain View of Christian Kingdom College. He graduated from Kentucky Christian College in Grayson, Kentucky, and has postgraduate work at Cincinnati Bible Seminary and Kent State University. And I might add uh, that uh, Andrew Sandlin also uh, attended Kent State University, too, I'm not proud of that. in uh, Kent, Ohio. So uh, hopefully we won't have any massacres uh, as they had there. Uh, but uh, Evangelist Dowdy, uh, of course, doing his work with Christian Kingdom College, uh, he will uh, uh, be the Calvinist opponent. And so without further ado, we'll start the program with Andrew Sandler. Thanks so much, Tommy. Well, it's very good to see all of you this evening. Pleasure to be here, to meet you folks from Church of Christ, Mountain View, and Christ Kingdom College. How many of you are... College students here, could I see your hand? That's great. Great to see you. Hope you listen carefully. I may not convince all of you or any of you, but it's uh, good to be here, and it's good for you to listen to what someone who holds a different theological viewpoint has to say. That's very valuable. And I appreciate the, the courage of these men, uh, Chuck and John, inviting me. I've enjoyed being with them and very grateful for their invitation. Good to see all of you Calcedon and friends and uh, supporters, and hope I can get to talk to some or all of you. I believe I saw Bill Einwechter come in. There he is, somewhere. He's a Reformed writer and scholar in his own right. So, Bill, I'm putting you on notice. If I get sick or fall down or have a heart attack, you're going to have to come right up immediately and, and take my place. Bill's the editor of The Christian Statesman, a fine, dedicated Christian man, and a, and a Calvinist and my friend. We're here to debate Reformed theology. I'd better get to that. I see that the clock is ticking there. We're here to debate Reformed theology, otherwise known as Calvinism. Uh, I stand with uh, what I believe to be the biblical teaching on this matter, in the Old Testament and its infallible authority, the New Testament, the Old Testament prophets, Jesus Christ, uh, John the Baptist, St. Paul, St. John, Augustine, in the patristic church especially, a number of the uh, earlier fathers, some in the medieval era. Specifically, however, though, the, the Protestant reformers, John Calvin and uh, John Knox, Farrell, Beza, to a lesser extent, Luther, the Westminster divines, various of the continental reformers, Heidelberg Catechism and so forth, the Puritans, the Scottish Covenanters, the Southern Presbyterians, the Old 
the old, not the new, Princeton tradition, the Hodges, Alexander, and so forth, the Southern Presbyterians, Dabney Thornwell, Abraham Kuyper in the Netherlands, Cornelius Van Til, up today to men like uh, R.J. Rashtuni, my mentor, and various others. We believe that these men, in essence, have taught biblical doctrine. The important thing is not these men, and that they taught it. The important thing is we believe this is what the Bible itself teaches. Chuck and I agree on the authority of Scripture, its inspiration, its infallibility, at least the formal authority of the Word of God. We both agree on that, that the Bible is absolute. We just disagree on what the Bible teaches, and that's what we're here tonight to address. Well, I better get right to the first topic. I'm not sure if we'll be able to get through all of them. I'll certainly do my best, and I'm not trying to dodge the issue if I don't, and maybe we can get into all of it in the rebuttal. But I want us to begin tonight by turning to Jeremiah chapter 31, and I believe the first issue that we're discussing this evening is the New Covenant as an Old Testament reality. Is the New Covenant faith present in the Old Testament? You better believe it is. Let's turn to Jeremiah 31 and read. I have about 80 to 100 scripture texts that I'd like for us to turn to tonight. There's going to be no way that we'll have time to do it. I will, however, cite some references, so if you're writing them down, you may want to, may want to do that or get a copy of the tape and look them up. I'll have to go quickly sometimes. Jeremiah 31 prophesies of a new covenant, although other texts in the Old Testament do the same thing. We could point to a number, but this is the one that's cited in Hebrews, and it's quite clear. Notice in verses 31 to 33, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, and he speaks of the provisions of this new covenant, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Now, most of the benefits of the new covenant were a reality in the Old Testament era. Let me give you some examples of that, and you may want to write them down. First of all, God had already written the law of God, His law, on the hearts of the Old Testament saints. This is predicted, notice, in verse 33 but it was already a reality in the Old Testament. Oh, you say, already a reality in the Old Testament? I thought it was something only in the New Testament. Oh, no, not at all. Turn to Psalm 37, for example, and we won't be able to turn to many scriptures, but let's turn there to begin. Most of the provisions of the New Covenant were existent in the Old Testament era. Speaking of the righteous, Psalm 37, verse 29. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. By the way, good defense of postmillennialism. The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom, and his tongue talketh of judgment. But especially notice verse 31. The law of God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. Quite clear, isn't it? But the law of God is placed in the heart of people in the Old Testament era. The same thing is said in chapter, in essence, in chapter 40. Well, let's, we'll take time to turn over there quickly. Chapter 40, Psalm 40, verses 7 and 8, of course, cited in the New Testament in Hebrews. And I don't have time to go into all the context here. I wish we did. Then said I, verse 7, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O God, yea, thy law is within my heart. It's a reality in the Old Testament era, the law of God within the heart. New covenant provision, Old Testament era. New covenant Christianity in the Old Testament, you'd better believe it. Point number two, God had already been a God to his people and had made them his people. I don't, I'm not going to give you the text or read it. Genesis 17, 7 Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6, say the, say the same thing. God had already been a God to his people and specially chosen them. 
Not only that, God had already in the Old Testament implied that the least to the greatest would belong to him. Let's turn in this one, Isaiah chapter 54. And there are several texts we could look at, but Isaiah 54. The promise that all of the covenant people would be a part of the people of God and none would teach his neighbor implied quite clearly in texts like Isaiah 54 and Jeremiah 3, 16 to 18. Notice verses 11 through 13 of Isaiah 54. Well, start in verse 12. And I will make thy windows of agates and thy gates of carbuncles and all thy borders of pleasant stones and all thy children shall be taught of the Lord and great shall be the peace of thy children. Predicted right there in the Old Testament. Right there in the Old Testament as a reality. Turn to Psalm 103 and I could say much, much more about that. I'm just trying to establish a point here and within the allotted time that we have. Psalm 103. What was another provision of the New Covenant? Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Only after Jesus Christ had come? Nonsense. We believe in the authority of the entire Bible, not just the New Testament. What does the Old Testament say? Verse 8 of Psalm 103. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. What a glorious promise in the Old Testament era. New covenant religion in the Old Testament. Thank God for those great Old Testament saints who are examples to us, many of whom were much better Christians than we are. This is what the book of Hebrews also teaches us. So then, what does it mean, the new covenant? New like brand new, like a brand new bicycle? No, it means renewed, like, for example, the Bible uses the term the new moon, same Hebrew word. God creates a new moon every time the cycle comes around, throw this one out and a brand new one. No, it means a new phase. And specifically, God's making a covenant with a new people, the multinational church of Jesus Christ rather than ethnic Israel. That's the sense in which the new covenant, for the most part, is new. Boy, I'd like to go to Galatians 4, 21 to 29, and uh, only halfway through this, and perhaps there'll be time to do that. You may want to write that text down, Galatians 4, 21 to 29, which proves that the distinction between the Old and New Covenants begins in the Old Testament era, where Isaac is depicted as a New Covenant believer in the Old Testament and is regenerate. Quite clear, and there's much, much more there, but For the sake of time, we'll move on. I'll conclude this section by saying that the entire Bible, the entire Bible is New Covenant Revelation. Now, we need to understand it was Melito, Bishop of Sardis, who sometime before A.D. 180 first designated the Hebrew canon as the Old Testament, just as the heretical Alexandrian father Origen first labeled the Greek canon the New Testament. Jesus doesn't call it that. John the Baptist doesn't call it that. Moses doesn't use those terms. St. Paul doesn't use them. When he uses the term, he does not referring to what we would say is the Old Testament or Hebrew Scriptures. He's referring to something else. Each of these designations, Old and New Testament, reflects a particular theological motivation not expressed or even implied in the Scriptures themselves. They're okay if they're used properly. Unfortunately, they're often not used properly. Is that, well, the Old Testament is just old and decrepit. You can't really read there and there's nothing good and it's old, but the New Testament is exciting and happy. Nonsense. The people in the Bible would never have thought that way. No one actually living in the period covered by the New Testament would have thought of himself as a New Testament Christian.